afternoon, you guys, and welcome to the Tuesday Times Roundtable, where each week we engage in conversation around current issues, trends, and problems that are of interest to you. I'm Sherry Beeson, your host and Senior Program Coordinator for the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. Behind the scenes, but never far away, is Taylor Signs, our communications guru, who sends you announcements regarding all things global and your Global Learning Medallion newsletter, The Globe. If you're just now joining us, I'd like to remind you to keep your mic muted during the presentation. But if you feel comfortable doing so, please turn your camera on, especially if you're asking a question. But we understand if you don't, and we are recording today's session. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our very own Yenis Lady Simon, our Global Learning Medallion Program Manager. In this role, Yeni leads the development, implementation, and evaluation of programs designed to increase your global awareness, global perspective, and global engagement. Her experience includes working nationally and internationally in the areas of education, international development, humanitarianism, gender advocacy, and global engagement. Yeni, take it away. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much for letting me guest host today Tuesday Times Roundtable. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Sherry mentioned, my name is Yeni Simon. Super excited to be here today um, and to see a lot of my students um, and super excited about the panel that I have for you. But before I get to talk to you about the speakers, let me um, talk to you about enacting global learning, a month long celebration of global learning that we have this month of March um, that includes tons of opportunities for you. So uh, for the students here today, if you haven't heard of these opportunities, please check them out. We have our global learning student fellowship for which you can apply until March 31st. Um, and to complete this fellowship, from fall 2021 and in spring 2022, you need to submit a proposal about a research project or an engagement project, and you can receive uh, up to $1,500 in funding to support that endeavor. Um, we also have the Roper L. Lean Global Learning Capstone Scholarship. So you know, as part of our programs, um, you have to complete a capstone that can be an internship, a fellowship, study abroad opportunity, whenever those return. Um, language courses or a research study, and you can apply for this scholarship to be able to support uh, one of those high impact opportunities. We also have the Robert B. Farrell Global Learning Scholarship in Sustainable Development, and that one provides funding specifically for students working in sustainable development projects. And we also have, I know it's a lot, uh, so you have a lot to choose from our 2021 transformation contest um, fly-in. You have until this Friday, March 19, to apply for that one. And you can submit an artistic piece that talks about a transformational intercultural or international experience that you've had. And then you can submit anything really, a song, poetry, an essay, a sculpture, anything in an artistic form counts. Um, and lastly, we have the Millennium Fellowship that um, applications are going until April 16th. And that one you apply as part as a cohort that will in fall 2021 implement a project addressing one of the sustainable development goals. If you have questions about any of those opportunities, I'm here to guide you through the application process. I'm gonna drop my email in the chat in a minute. You know where to find me. I'd be more than happy to support your applications. Um, and then very this, this slide is very specifically for transformation contest. Again, you have until this Friday to submit your piece. And then the winners go uh, and participate in a virtual flying in Washington DC. So you get to connect with uh, the movers and shakers of our nation's capital. Um, and last year, actually, our DC uh, flying happened virtually. Your students still had a really amazing uh, experience. So I encourage you to apply. And before I 
introduce the panel. Let me just mention that tomorrow we have a Women in STEM Fields panel organized by our very own uh, GLM student, Maria Camas, and we're bringing back three FIU alumni, um, Camila Uscategui, who graduated with the GLM in 2016, is coming back to moderate this panel. We have two recent um, PhD graduates from FIU that are coming back as well, and two Millennium Fellows, one from Ghana and one from Puerto Rico. So it's going to be a really interesting discussion between students and um, our uh, doctors out there in the field talking about what does it mean to be a woman in STEM um, and the different experiences and mentorship and representation, all those uh, really important topics um, that, that are discussed in, in, in these settings. That's happening tomorrow at 12. And next Thursday, if you have uh, questions about any of the opportunities happening this month, you can join the info session at 1 p.m. And with that said, I think that was my, okay, that was my last slide. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna say, uh, super happy to have here Daniela, Lexi and Luisana. Daniela, I work very closely with at Startup FIU. Uh, Lexi um, has been reaching now recently and, and I love all the opportunities that she has to offer to our students and Luisana. Uh, who we all love, um, is an alumna of the class of 2019, and she's super involved with global learning. So thank you all so much for being here. The floor is yours, is yours uh, Dani. Uh, take it away. Thank you again. No, thank you for having us, Yanni. Um, and hello, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you today virtually. Um, I know for Luisana, it's always like a delight to come back to FIU and give back. And for many of you that maybe Miami is not home, um, Miami is a, a city, but it's such a small town. Um, and so little by little, you'll see that like people know each other, especially as we talk about today about global shapers, um, how, you know, how integrated it is in our city. And if you're roughly like one or two people away from someone that you want to know in Miami, you just got to know the right one or two people. So on that note, um, today I'm going to wear First, my startup FIU hat, and then I'm going to switch my hat and be my global shaper, all right? So for the time being right now, I'm going to go ahead and, like I said, wear my startup FIU hat. Um, let me go ahead and expand this a little bit. So you all can see my screen, some thumbs up. Perfect. All right, so like um, I was introduced, my name is Daniela Cadena. Um, my day job is as director of Venture Ready Programs here at Startup FIU. And so I wanted to take a moment and talk about what is Startup FIU, because our university is so big and it's sometimes really hard for students to know everything that's available to them. Like, I wish I would have known about all the amazing opportunities that you all have when I was an undergrad back in a lot of years ago. Um, so. Startup FIU is an initiative um, in the university that fosters and develops entrepreneurship and innovation to help our students, researchers, and community connect, contribute to, and thrive in today's fast-changing world. Specifically for student entrepreneurship, we focus on exposing students to, to the entrepreneurship skills, tools, and mental frameworks required to both adapt and thrive in a fast-changing global landscape while also empowering them to solve the world's most complex and pressing challenges. So we know a lot of students might be really eager about like starting their own companies, but some students might just be really eager about solving really cool problems for really big companies or institutions. And so where that plays for them. Um, for student entrepreneurship, there are different uh, offerings available to you from different events to virtual roundtables. We have hands-on workshops, entrepreneurship boot camps, and entrepreneurship competitions, like the Halt Prize Global Social Entrepreneurship Competition that Luisana participated in as a student. She also was a campus director back when she was an undergrad. And so these different competitions are a really cool way, like many of you might know, to like push yourself to meet new people and gain like really cool experience that you can add to your resume. So what's the applied programs um, at Startup FIU? There's this program called the Social Venture Studio. And what it really is, is that we've designed a variety of programs that are available to students at different stages of the entrepreneurship journey, we really focus on the earliest stages of entrepreneurship. So for those that are interested in like 
that have ideas. I wanted to see how do you go from idea to a product or service. Um, and then we have an impact studio. Uh, those are students that might be interested in, in learning entrepreneurship, but don't really have ideas. And so what you do is you apply into a kind of pre-selected uh, startup idea and you form a team and work on it throughout uh, the program together. So right now applications are open for the summer programs. Um, if you're interested, I'll just drop a link later on the chat. Um, and then that way you can follow up with us if you're interested in those. There's also events and what we call learning communities. These are, these are two virtual roundtables that take place every single week. Hacker Nation is really philosophical and it discusses um, things around technology and current events, philosophy, and so much more. And then we have Student Hustlers, which I just came from. Um, this is a virtual roundtable that brings in st together students that you know, are starting their own companies, are thinking about starting their own e-commerce companies, whatever it might be. And it's just a safe space for us to talk to each other and really bounce off ideas and help each other through the different struggles because being an entrepreneur might sound sexy, but it's really hard and it might sometimes feel very lonely. So that's why we've created these different spaces for us to come together. And then I wanted to give a shout out to a cool design sprint that we're putting together on March 24th at 1 p.m. And it's with a, it's with a cool program um, that is in Hungary. So we're trying to take advantage of the fact that we are virtual and see how we can collaborate with different innovation hubs around the world. All right. Um, so. Now let's talk, I'm gonna switch my hat. I'm gonna now be a global shaper. Um, today, we brought together a panel um, of three global shapers because we, first of all, we wanted to showcase what global shapers are and really get the word out there because it's such a phenomenal opportunity for the youth in our city and around the world. And we wanted to also bring in the lens of, you know, what's it like to merge your like love or passion for impact with financial stability in a career that sometimes traditional paths have told us that they have to be separate, but slowly and surely, and many of you that are you know part of global learning, you're here because you believe in your core that you can do good by still having a successful and stable career and that they don't have to be one or the other. And so I wanna to introduce to you um, what the Miami Hub is, but before I do that, let me talk about our panel. So um, you already know me, I'm Daniel Cadena. Um, I wanna introduce Lexi uh, Prather and then Luisana Zambrano. I'm gonna go ahead and take off my screen so we can um, see each other's faces. And um, I'll kick it off with some very basic questions. Um, so maybe Lexi, uh, if you can kick us off, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what is your day job right now? Definitely. Um, so as Annie said, my name is Lexi and I am originally from Massachusetts. I moved to Miami exactly two years ago, the end of March. Um, so I had one amazing year full of Miami being open and then I've had one year of it <laughs> being a little closed and, you know, haven't been able to explore as much. Um, but really, really enjoying it here. I'm liking it a lot. I'm loving the sunshine and didn't want to live in, in the cold weather anymore in Massachusetts. Um, so I came down here to do my master's um, at the University of Miami. I got a master's in sustainable business and I graduated last May. And I was searching, job searching during the, the height of the pandemic. Um, so it really took me a while to find a position, but luckily this past September, I found a role um, and I can share more about this later, but I actually found it through my Global Shapers Network. Um, a coworker of mine is a member of our hub. Um, so I'm working for an organization called Urban Impact Lab. They've been around since 2013, um, doing a lot of different projects in Miami around public space, um, a lot of civic innovation work. And I am was hired as their uh, program manager to help run a website called Access Helps, which is a gathered resource of um, a gathered source of resources for anyone dealing with. Um, you know, issues related to COVID-19. So there's a lot of support for small business owners and also renters, uh, individuals and families, uh, information on food distribution, just really trying to support people through throughout this time. Um, so yeah, that's what I do, do on my day job. 
Um, thank you, Lexi. We're super happy to have you here. I'm gonna show, uh, throw it off to you, Luisana, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, and then of course, like what is your current day job that you're up to? Hi everyone, thank you so much for having us here. Um, my name is Luisana Zambrano. I am Venezuelan. I came uh, from Venezuela in 2015 to study here in the US. I graduated um, with a major in international relations. I'm a 2019 FIU alumna. Uh, as a global learning student, honors college student, uh, and my experience at FIU was amazing. Um, and I would say that everything that I did on my time at FIU um, helped me to where I am right now. Uh, so I was also a student assistant at Startup FIU where I learned so much about social entrepreneurship um, and social innovation. And like, I think that's uh, where my passion uh, for merging you know, social issues, but also action, like I don't know, flourish um, through the different student competitions and activities that I did at, at Startup FIU, um, which led me to be where I am right now. Um, I'm a program associate at Radical Partners. Uh, we are a social impact accelerator where we, impact, uh, we invest in leaders, engage local, grow ventures, and design innovative solutions to collectively make our communities stronger. So my work at Radical Partners, I'm a program associate, so I support um, throughout the companies um, and organization programs. Uh, between them, uh, I support the 10 Days of Connection, which is a um, massive community engagement initiative we're doing 10 days from like May 1st to May 10th. Um, we engage locals to have conversations um, to foster communication and foster understanding between groups that wouldn't like talk to each other like normally. I also support um, the Strategic Planning Summit, which is um, a strategic planning uh, cohort for uh, leaders, for community leaders, for them to create their strategic plans for their organizations. And I also support the Leadership Lab which is also a um, development program for leaders in our community on their early stages. Mm -hmm. So I'm super excited. Um, and as Lexi said, um, I also found my job, <laughs> my current job through Global Shapers. Uh, Joanne, who is the current executive director uh, at Radical Partners, she was also a Global Shaper for the Miami Hub uh, when I joined and she encouraged me to apply for that job. I honestly also last year <laughs> during the middle of the pandemic, so as Lexi, it took me a little while to find a job, um, but I'm super excited. I've been working at Radical Partners for about nine months now. Um, yeah. Congratulations. Um, so we've been uh, brushing up a little bit on this concept of social entrepreneurship. So before we dive deep into like, you know, finding that like path between impact and a successful career, let's backtrack and, and really talk about like what is Lexi, maybe I'll just throw that question to you. Like, what do you think is defines a social entrepreneur versus a traditional entrepreneur? And I know that's something that you are very familiar with yourself. Yeah, so, um, and what Danny's hinting at is um, I have a little side hustle um, where I have a sustainable clothing brand called Shop Alexina, where I um, really just try to promote the secondhand clothing industry and also do a fair amount of upcycling of clothing. So, you know, not wasting, not um, throwing clothing out, but maybe making it something new or creating more value out of a, a piece of clothing um, by purchasing secondhand and kind of, you know, upgrading it. Um, so I started that about two years ago. Um, but to answer, answer your question, you know, the main difference I think is um, kind of a, a more holistic approach to business. So not looking at entrepreneurship and uh, business as like only profit. Um, you can have, you know, a return that is something that's social as well, something that impacts either um, the community or your employees or um, the environment. It doesn't have to be, you know, human impact, but having um, just something in mind that's kind of beyond the profit. Obviously, you have to still be an entrepreneur. You have to create a sustainable business that is financially sound and, you know, can run and, and um, exist without, you know, with, with like being able to run as a business. But having that um, ability to value the social side of it as well, I think, is, is the main difference. Um, and I think some of the, the most incredible social entrepreneurs in the world really think about that from the inception of their business. So it's not really an afterthought. It's like included 
in the beginning. Um, obviously, it's, it's more of a newer term. I mean, it's been around for a while, but it's gaining more traction. So I think there are businesses that exist that are learning about it and they're kind of shifting. But I do think some of the most, um, some of the, the businesses with the strongest impact have had that in their core from the beginning, even before it was called social entrepreneurship. Yeah. And I think um, one of the, one of the most important distinctions that it, that like it's very it's essential for all students and I think our the newer generations to be aware of is social entrepreneurship is fairly new right it's been around for a while but unlike the financial sector that has standard language standardization across the markets across the stock market the social entrepreneurship space doesn't yet so for example a big difference is in social enterprises, you know how uh, Lexi mentioned that unlike business that is just driven for profit, many of you might be familiar with the triple bottom line, right? There's profits, there's people, and then there's the planet. But what does that mean in a financial report? How do you measure the impact of having someone be educated or having a woman have access to maternal health? Health. What's the impact of that? And that's when things start to get a little bit complex in the impact sector. But I think it's a really exciting part for all of us to be aware that you are kind of riding the wave and you are part of a generation that gets to like think about these challenges and think about the standardization and think about how you quantify impact. So be comfortable with ambiguity, especially if you're in the social innovation space. It's anything but standard. But I think it's one of the coolest parts of it, too. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll throw it to Luisana now. You know, what do you think is some of the biggest challenges that you face or you think students face when they're trying to figure out, you know, what should I do with my career? I have this passion to save the world, but I also want to pay rent. And like, like, you know, how did you, what are some of the challenges that you faced and how did you overcome those, Luisana? Um, so as I shared earlier, um, my background is in international relations, so it was very policy oriented, very like nonprofit oriented, like traditional nonprofits. Uh, so when I started studying, I was like, I'm going to go and just work at a nonprofit, uh, like human rights nonprofit. It doesn't matter if I don't get paid, you know, <laughs> and then like reality is that, like, as Danny said, we have to like pay rent and we have bills to pay. Uh, and like, even if you have student loans, you have to pay for your student loans as, as well, right? Um, so um, by, as I said also, um, when I was at startup, I learned about this concept of social entrepreneurship where like uh, doing good, it doesn't have to mean a sacrifice for you personally and professionally uh, and financially, right? Um, and like having this concept of like doing good, but also like while doing good, uh, like you can make profit out of it. And like with the profit you make, you can also keep doing good was like mind blowing for me when I learned that uh, that concept. Um, and the way I, ha I kept like learning uh, and being more involved in the social impact ecosystem um, here in Miami was like being curious and like just trying new things and learning new things and like going to panels and like meeting with group of people that like kind of had the same um, ideas or goals into, the, into like what they wanted to do, uh, like being involved in the social impact ecosystem. Um, one of the things that I did um, was like being very involved at Startup FIU um, and learning that concept of like business um, and innovation and how that can translate into like a career that can also make an impact, um, you know, in, in the community. Um, so one of the things that I've been doing, I'm also pursuing a, a master's degree in human centered interaction design, um, which is very important when you want to create impact because you want to create impact from the need of the people. Um, and by doing that master and also working where I'm working right now, I can see the compliment like right there. Um, and as, I think Lexi or Danny shared, um, like companies are now moving towards that uh, social impact or like social entrepreneurship uh, mindset. Um, many companies are right now opening that field into a company. So like corporate social responsibility, how to create uh, projects and programs that are focusing on human needs. And when we say about human needs are not only like uh, financial needs, but also like social needs. So there is like a growing field uh, right now into like how to merge creating an impact in the community, but also 
finding a stable job that I can pay for your for your bills, you know, and I can support you financially. But in summary, I would say being very involved, being curious, and like learning so much, like learning from different fields that can like take you to that avenue to like creating impact. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen really quick because I think it's important to make this distinction. Um, and then we'll continue our conversation. Uh, share my screen. All right, so I know that we're throwing a lot the word like business or nonprofit. So let me, let me take a moment to highlight two key differences, right? Traditional entrepreneurs, when we talk about value proposition, it's why someone pays for your service, right? Or why someone gives you their data. So the value proposition of a traditional entrepreneur they anticipate and organize to serve markets that can comfortably afford the new product or service and is thus designed to create financial profit. Social entrepreneurs, this word is now being used as mission, entre mission driven entrepreneurs, conscious entrepreneurship. These are their value proposition targets an underserved, neglected, or highly disadvantaged population that lacks the financial means or political clout to achieve the transformative benefit on its own. And so it takes way more creativity to figure out like, how do you serve this market? Why can't they access the goods and services? And then the other um, kind of thing I wanted to highlight is we throw a lot the word social impact versus social innovation and social entrepreneurship and corporate social responsibility. So social impact, um, and this is my, again, because there's not a lot of perfect standardization, I'm going to say, like, as me who teaches this, you know, social um, social impact is when a business has a core business model that is now transitioning into a embedding corporate social responsibility metrics, uh, adopting sustainable practices and targets. But it doesn't mean that their core business is a social enterprise, like Lexi mentioned in the beginning, that they, they bake it in from inception. So an example of this might be Microsoft right? What's Microsoft's core business? Building software. Now they build hardware as well with their Xboxes. And then in 2020, they announced that they were going to be carbon negative by 2030, that they would remove all historical carbon emissions by 2050, and that they would provide a $1 billion climate innovation fund. That's a social impact company, right? They're embedding sustainability in their businesses, but the core business is still software, all right? What's a social enterprise? Well, a social enterprise could be a company, let's say like Aspire, who, and I'll, I don't know if someone can Aspire. I'll, I'll put the link after. But Aspire basically works with um, underserved or neglected farmers in uh, different countries in Africa, understands their needs, how the drought works, what access to capital they have to buy their uh, seeds, and then trains them so that they can be micro farmers and produce grasshoppers right? Because it's a very um, viable protein source for the region. And everything about their business model from who they employ to how they, uh, how they source their products to how um, they use the materials and how it actually generates revenue and who earns money. Thank you, uh, Luisana, just put the link on the chat. Um, that is a social enterprise. All right, so I wanted to kind of take a moment to highlight that because I think for many of you that are interested in this space, you need to take the time to learn about these things, right? You need to want to question, like, what is social impact versus social entrepreneurship? And I'll leave you with something else, which is ESG funds, environmental, social, and governance funds. So these are now being embedded into the financial system, right, to how companies are being valued, how investors value companies. And we can't shy away from the business. Because no matter if you're a nonprofit or for-profit, you need money to make money. You need money to do good in the world. And so we can't shy away from finances a little bit, okay? So, Alexia, I want to throw it back to you. Um, you know, you've mentioned that, like, through Global Shapers, you had, an, like, an, like, an introduction to your new role. First of all, would you tell me a little bit about, like, what is Global Shapers um, and, like, why is there a Miami hub and like other countries and other cities like that? Can you give us some uh, context, please? Definitely. So the three of us here today are speaking from the uh, Global Shapers Miami hub. 
but there are over 400 hubs all over the world in many different countries, all, all continents, you know, spread out all over the place. Um, most of them center around a city or, you know, a larger um, uh, area where there's a grouping of people. Um, I believe there are three or four other in Florida. I think there's an Orlando hub. There might be a Jacksonville hub um, just for a kind of sense of, of where they, they usually um, are located, but they all look really different. Like the New York hub is, is a quite large hub, um, though there are some with smaller numbers, um, but the main core kind of focus of them is that you're part of this larger network um, and then you focus in on your local community. So every hub is doing their own projects, they're catering, you know, their uh, members and their the work that they do to the local area. They definitely collaborate with other hubs and there's, you know, class cross hub collaboration. Um, but the core kind of focus is to be very locally minded and invested in the city or the town or the area that that you live in. Um, so our Miami hub has about 20 members now, I believe a little bit more than 20. Um, and we are, it's a range of people who are, you know, born and raised in Miami. Uh, all three of us on this call um, have different experiences in Miami, different amount of time in Miami. Um, it's a really diverse group of people who come from different walks of life, different um, academic backgrounds, different job professions. Um, really open to, to anyone that's interested in spending their time um, joining this, this organization. So that's kind of the one like requirement, I think, to, to be a shaper is that you you are willing to, it's volunteer effort. So like it's um, the the reward is, is really like the network that, that you build in my opinion um, and the, the connection that you have with your city. So for me, it's been really amazing because I just moved here two years ago and I, I really didn't have a network. I moved down with my partner. I knew one person in Miami. Um, I, I knew, I really knew no one. Um, so it was something that I really wanted to join, um, from first moving here because it's also, um, there's an age range. So they are trying to focus in on, um, kind of young professionals out of maybe education, uh, their range to apply is 18 to 27. Um, but then you're an alumni for the rest of your life. So that network that you build while you are a part of the, the hub and you're an active member is something that stays with you um, for the rest of your life. So that's kind of some information about it. I'll let maybe Luisana um, expand a bit, but it's it's really cool concept um, in my opinion, because you're part of this large global effort, but you really focus in on your local community. Um, and I think that's just like such a powerful approach to social impact and what we've, what we've been talking about. Thank you, Lexi. Well, Luisana is the, she joined last year and now she's the incoming curator for our Miami hub. So in, in our hubs, we don't have the terms president or vice president. We have curator and vice curator, but it kind of, it is a leadership position. And we also have an impact officer role, which is a new role that started only last year. So I'm like the current impact officer. Luisana is the incoming global shaper, um, Miami hub curator. And so um, as our incoming curator, you know, Luisana, why did you join Global Shapers? Um, and how has it impacted your life? Um, well, I'm so excited to be the incoming curator uh, for Global Shapers Miami Hub. Um, and I want to start that I joined the, the Miami Hub, um, you know, up, like besides also having the network that you can have from the Global Shapers community, you can also like do hands-on experience, right? If you, I think like if you want to start or um, like tip your toes, you know, what is the social impact ecosystem? What do you do? Uh, like to create impact in our community. So it's like from creating projects to volunteering to like meeting people that have the same uh, like mindset to like knowing from like very knowledgeable people that comes like from the headquarters, which is like from the Global Shapers community overall. Uh, there's like, a, like a, such an amount of people that know so much about different diverse um, topics that you have that access available for you uh, by being a Global Shaper. Um, so adding with what, um, Lexi said, the, like the different hubs, um, around the world tackle their specific problems in the community. 
So like the projects that you have throughout the world are very different, um, but very focused on their, on their specific communities. So I could give you some examples. Um, we have been working, for example, here in the Miami Hub, we, like last year we worked at, around shipping the boat, which was around um, civic engagement, uh, voter mobilization, voter education, um, throughout the 2020, like around the 2020 election. So there was a, a, a topic that we wanted to focus in the US just because like we were around like the, um, the election cycle. But you have other hubs, for example, the Caracas hub, which are focusing on having conversations around um, Caracas 2030 agenda. That's how they call it. Um, and they're focusing on gathering the community in Caracas to see how they can rebuild the, com like the community and the country based on the whole crisis that is happening in the country, right? So you can have like different uh, projects around the specific problems that are happening in the community. Um, and I think that's like, one of the most valuable things about uh, being a shaper um, is that you put in action what you're learning and what you want to do. Um, so as an incubator, um, I'm very excited like to keep working uh, with this amazing group of people uh, that are also interested and like excited. Um, uh, creating impact in the community and try new things and try new projects uh, to see how we could, yeah, do an impact in the community. So I, I've been a I've been a global shaper member for almost six years now. Um, so I joined when I joined Global Shapers, it was like a north star that came into my life because I was about to graduate uh, FIU. Um, back when I graduated, there was not a lot of uh, social innovation, uh, like even mentioned at the university level, let alone in like industry. So I was, I had an offer from um, some very cool internships I was a part of, but I wanted to turn them down. And my family thought I was crazy, right? Who turns down these amazing companies? But I just couldn't imagine myself working for them for three, four years, um, doing something I just, that didn't wake me up. Um, call me a little naive or whatever it was, but I, I just thought I could find a job that was better fit with what I wanted to do, right? Finding Global Shapers um, was actually by luck. I, Global Shapers, I didn't understand was a something you applied to and they were having a, a, a conference. So they have like a regional conferences. So they have Global Shapers in Latin America, Global Shapers in North America. And they do like these massive conventions of young people from all over the world and we travel and we meet each other. And I ended up being a volunteer because I just wanted to meet these people. And in the Latin America conference, that I was a volunteer in every picture. <laughs> I was involved in everything. Um, and throughout those two days, someone said, hey, you got to meet the people in Miami. Um, and little did I know that this existed, that this community existed in my own backyard. I applied. And finding Global Shapers was very important to me because it connected me with people that have become my friends that are in this space that I can call and be like, I am so confused about X problem that I'm seeing in a company, right? I'm coaching these students, like they have become my thought partners. Um, people that like, hey, I have an amazing student that's about to graduate, do you have a position, right? Like there are people from all walks of life that also helped, helped under, help you understand that you're not crazy and wanting to do good for the world. And that's what it represented to me, that there was a community of other people just like me that wanted to do good and were eager to shape the world and, and, and that they can do it. Nothing's perfect though, right? Because we are, because we're part of the World Economic Forum, we're under like the umbrella World Economic Forum, but each hub is very free to do what they want based on their community. So we have growing pains like every other organization. Um, every time we have an incoming cohort, we wanna make sure that their interests aligned with like the projects that we're doing, but that we're not losing focus of the true needs in our community, right? Um, so someone was asking about the different projects. So around like Shape the Vote, we also had civic dinners. Right now, the big push from the World Economic Forum is mobilizing the youth. So um, there are different pillars and every hub has the freedom to like really look at, well, how do we support this mission, right? And what is the real need in our community? And I think that's the coolest part, right? We're also apolitical, so we're not supposed, is it apolitical? Like you're not partisan. You're not partisan, um, but it doesn't mean that we're not involved in politics, right? Like shaping the vote was our way to have civic engagement. 
Um, so that's something that I wanted to throw out there. It's sometimes a question that gets thrown our way because we are under an entity that sometimes doesn't have the best light in everyone's eyes. Um, so the World Economic Forum is, our, is like our parent, but every city has freedom to do what they want, okay? Um, I'm gonna ask one more question and I think we're gonna open up the floor for everyone. Um, so, you know, Lexi or, or Luciana, whoever wants to take this, um, what do you think makes a good candidate for Global Shapers? Um, and yeah, we'll leave it out there at that. Do you wanna go first, Luciana? And I'll, I'll okay. take that. Okay. I, I can go and, and we'll, we'll complement each other. <laughs> um, I think that what makes a good candidate for Global Shapers, uh, it's that you are eager to learn eager to try um, and eager to fail at the same time, but also while you fail, learning. Um, and that's like one of the things that I've learned through Global Shapers. Ah, I just wanted to say that like also who encouraged me to apply for Global Shaper was Danny uh, <laughs> when I was a student. Um, and honestly, it has been a great experience for me. Like for me, um, the learning curve that I had while being Global Shapers, like from being uh, you know, for seeing what they were doing, like from the outside to start in 2019 as when I was a student as well. I was, I was actually an undergraduate student when I joined Global Shapers and I graduated, passed through this um, journey of like changing jobs and finding a job and like getting to the to point that where I am right now um, has been amazing. Uh, but yeah, it's like that openness to learn and try things. Yeah, and not just add, I think one of the like greatest parts about the Global Shapers Network is that there really isn't like a distinct profile or like a, a, a specific person that should apply or a background or an academic focus or a job. Um, it's more about just like your your um, kind of passion and your interests. So if you have like an, an area that is very passionate of yours that you want to like do more in and you have time and you want like bodies and motivation and like a group to help you on it like that's a great person who could join because they could use this network and this hub as you know a way to dive into that passion um or if you want to like like Luisana said if you want to just like learn if you're in a space where you're like for me I, I really knew very little about Miami when I first moved here so I didn't come in wanting to to lead a project I wanted to come in and just meet people and learn about kind of what was happening here so I know that's like a vague answer and it doesn't really answer the question, but I think it's very unique in the sense that, especially from our hub, you know, we're not, when we recruit, we're not looking for a specific person. We're just looking for someone who, when we invite them to a few events, they show up and they, you know, they contribute and they um, are either like actively listening or they're engaging in the conversation. Um, so you don't even need to have a really strong personality or, you know, be very like loud or like, um, you know, very, like, it's hard on, we're all on Zoom right now. So like, even that can be really difficult for people who might not feel as comfortable talking in a Zoom room. But that's not kind of the, the main way I think that you can really show up in this community. It's more about um, just, you know, being an active member and either listening or engaging, whatever it might be. But, um, but yeah, so that, that, that's kind of my answer to <laughs> typical shaper. Thank you. So we'll open up the floor right now for questions. Um, I think the three of us are fairly comfortable answering questions that could be like about our personal careers or it could be specifically about Global Shapers. Um, you can feel free to like uh, unmute yourself or type it on the on the chat. And I see we have a hand raised. Uh, yeah, Yanni? Um, I'm going to go in really quickly. So that gives our students time to think about the questions I want to ask, but I just wanted to clarify, Danny. I think you talked a little bit about the parent organization, the pillars that you get, and you you can, you have some flexibility in choosing what to focus on. But even within our Miami community, there are a lot of issues competing for attention. Yeah. So I mean, I know the like the 2020 civic engagement was obviously so important, but so are other issues impacting our community. How do you as a group decide? this is what we're gonna focus on, or do you have the bandwidth to say we're choosing three different projects? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. So um, let, 
this is where I said that no organization is perfect because we're also a volunteer organization. And I do want to highlight that when you join the Shapers, it's, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is it five years where you age out or is it now the entire time? Do you guys know? Because like when I joined, it'd be like five years and then you become an alumni or if you age to 33 years old. Um, I, I think, think the five years is, a th I think it's just you age out, I believe. Okay, I'm going to be a Shaper for like ever. Okay, <laughs> got it. Okay, um, so imagine if you come in as an 18 year old, you're supposed to be a global shaper till you're 33, okay? Um, if you come in when you're 27, you age out when you're 33 and you enter an alumni status. And like these networks are very, very powerful. Like when we talk about you get access to the network, there's an, like an entire like LinkedIn for global shapers. Okay, like it's an actual platform that you can message people, blah, blah, blah. So if you're like two people away from people in Miami, being part of the Shapers, you're probably like three people away from like an ambassador, right? Um, like really, really cool work. And there's folks from all over the world. Like I've known Shapers that have been part of like, like, like advocacy revolutions and they've had to flee the country, right? Because they were a huge part of like mobilizing the youth in whatever country they were in. So going back to these problems in our community, you know, we've had to like talk about what are the problems in our community. And we had to, after like November came, we had a brainstorm session, right? And I think it was like halfway in the year into COVID, everyone was feeling a lot of like the mental health toll. So we had to take a pause and say, hey, some of us are going to focus on like internal projects for our team to like make sure everyone is doing well. Um, we had to revisit, okay, what are, who are people we know in the community and what are project like nonprofits or activities that are taking place that can use our help, right? Like we're not trying something really big. That's um, why the impact officer was created. Like the role that I'm in now is because a lot of hubs were kind of competing for the same projects. And what we're, we're trying to shift is who in our community can use our help, right? We're like 20 something super brilliant young people how can we help those projects? And it it's going to take a lot of conversations. It's going to take some iteration. It's going to take some trying and failing. So if you're also looking for a safe space to gain that experience of what it's like to talk with people from different walks of life, to self-organize, to like have difficult discussions and disagree with someone, the Global Shapers Hub is like a really safe space to do that um, because everyone comes from good intentions but we might have completely different ideas. Um, and that's a whole learning opportunity on its own. So I know that wasn't like a super clear question uh, answer, but it gives you some context on like the different layers, right? And, and many people can run with their own projects in the hub. Like people are free to propose something that they might be passionate about. Um, at some point, someone was um, really big on like immigration reform and they were supporting like, immigrant uh, farmers and like creating programs for that. Uh, right now we have someone that's really big on mental health and they're trying to work with a, a local nonprofit to see how they expand their mental health training to populations that aren't, aren't currently getting it. So there's a lot of freedom for that depending on people's interests and if they meet the need. So I'm there to ask, is it meeting a need in the community? Um, <laughs> that's my job in the hub. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Lani. Thank you so my much. My pleasure. Um, the students here today, any questions? Somebody roll one. Do you have to physically be in Miami to join the hub or can you be out of state? Okay, so <laughs> Lexi, you wanna take it? Yeah, um, I can take it. So you, it's a little strange right now because before pre-COVID, everything was in person. So we did require um, for people to be physically in Miami, we would meet um, as a monthly on a monthly basis as a group. It would be in person. We do a lot of you know volunteering events and and things that required people to be in person. Um, we've had a few members who have gone off to grad school or moved away, knowing they're coming back to Miami, and those um, people have been able to kind of stay in touch. Um, and now that we're virtual, it, it shifts all of this a bit, but we do require that that people are at least in Miami frequently enough that they, you know, can attend these events or be a part of anything that's in person. We do hope to be, you know, back to in person as soon as possible. Um, we're still on Zoom. So there's, there's some flexibility there, but 
We also recommend that if you're moving or you're going to another city to try and see if there's a hub there. Um, so we also have, you know, it doesn't mean you have to end your Global Shaper um, kind of career or, you know, your Global Shaper membership. Um, you can typically connect with that other hub and, you know, have an introduction from either leadership or try to get a foot in the door that way. We can't guarantee it. Some hubs are like either at capacity and they can't always accept new membership. Um, but it's this weird kind of in between right now because we are on Zoom, but um, typically it's, it's best to be based in that city so that you can engage locally and, you know, be a part of all those, those in-person events. But if you are out of state and you're on this call and you're, you're interested in like connecting with another hub, we could try and see if we have that connection. Um, so it doesn't mean, you know, like to not, to not connect with us or anything. Um, it's just kind of forward thinking, like once we go back to in-person, it's, it's best if you're in that, that city. For someone looking to, that's interested in applying, what, what should we suggest that they do? Yes. So right now um, we're, I'm a part of the recruitment committee um, for the, the hub. And right now we have closed the application process. Um, application link is still open and available online. So we can definitely send that out. Um, and we accept applications, you know, any time of the year. We've just paused the, the process because we have people join in cohorts. So you're never going to be a single individual joining a large group of 20 plus people. That can be a little overwhelming. Um, you'll always join with a group. So right now we're going through that process um, with people who have applied kind of up until the end of January, early February. And then we reopen the, the interview process in June, July of this year. Um, so feel free to, to submit an application if you're interested. We will obviously email you and be in contact, um, but we wouldn't re kind of open that interview process until this summer. But in the meantime, um, we can, you know, if you are interested in applying now, we will take obviously your contact information and invite you to some of the events that are more um, social focused, either volunteering, things that aren't kind of member specific. Um, we try to do a lot of events that are either, you know, beach cleanups or community gardening, uh, things in the community that are, you know, right now it's, it's a little hard, um, but we have a, a book club, a, a movie night coming up. So there's other things that we're able to do that aren't as like internal facing. Um, so that could be a great opportunity for anyone who's on this call who's interested in feeling it out, who isn't really sure yet, but you know, they might want to join. The interview process is very much um, like a two-way street. We want the person interviewing to make sure that they want it as much, you know, as as we're interested in them. So it's really an opportunity to make sure it's something you want to sign up for before you commit to, <laughs> to being a member. So um, it's right now it's, it is technically the process is closed. The application link is always open. And, um, I think Danny's going to share our emails, but like you could always connect with one of us if you want to learn more. Um, and come June, July of this year, we'll, we'll restart that whole process with anyone who's applied up until then. Yeah, I would highly recommend, like, if you're interested in applying, like go right now to your Google calendar and put in June, like make sure to check Instagram or email Luisana or email Daniela, like try to follow up closer to that time. Um, like actively do that because it, it is because it's volunteer based, like that, that initiative from every person is a key part of the hub. Like everyone has to do their part. Um, otherwise it's imagine rallying like 20, 30 people, right. Um, to, to come together to solve really interesting problems. I'm going to answer a question really quick that was on the chat. Are there specific trainings to enhance skills or is it an active learning experience every time? It is an active learning experience every time, but when as a hub, there's a clear need for some training, we tend to like look within our network and see if we can bring someone. So I think um, we had a training on like mental health and stress because everyone was clearly dealing with a lot of <laughs> stress and not knowing how to manage their time. Um, we also had like, like we talk a lot about diversity, equity, inclusion, but some of us don't really know what that means and how to embed that in our jobs or in our in the work that we do every day. So we had a training come into that. So it is an active learning experience, but the hub is, it's really hard to communicate, but we are 
it sounds cheesy, but we do become like family in the sense of like, hey, I'm, I'm really struggling to figure out how to do X. Normally, someone within the hub can train that person or connect you immediately to someone that will train you. Um, so it's really how much you put into it and how much you can get out of it. I hope that answered your question. Um, I know we're wrapping up, so really quick, if, there's, if anyone has any questions, speak up or share it. In the meantime, uh, fireside really quick. Lisana, what's your favorite part of being Global Shaper? <laughs> um, for me, it's both uh, the community. Well, actually, we'll say three points. Uh, the community, uh, and that includes the global community and the Miami community. Um, the fact that we can try new things, uh, you know, to help the community and like understand, like, try to figure out where the needs, uh, come up with a solution, actionable solution that we could help uh, the people in, in the community. Um, and three, I would say the challenge, honestly, it's like the challenge, uh, like personal challenge for you to, for us to think more, uh, to go through these trainings, uh, through like, uh, talk about conversations that we usually don't talk or don't have we like i don't know like with our friends or family um and for that to be the safe space to have that conversation uh those type of conversations so that's my favorite part of being a global shaper lexi um my favorite thing is the how close it's brought me to the city so i moved from uh, new york and i lived in boston and i never really felt connected to those cities um, I think partly because they were, they're pretty large and I just never found like a core community in either one. Um, so for me, it's like the experience I've had in Miami and, and what Global Shapers has brought to that. Um, and it, it, it's always changing. Like we're always doing something different. Um, it's not, it's not like a, we have, we have a monthly meeting, but even every month it feels different and exciting. So even within the, the process of it, it's, it's, kind of always shifting. We have new leadership every year. Um, so it's it's never really gets boring. It's, it's definitely a, an amazing thing to be a part of that um, keeps me learning about Miami, but also, you know, keeps me learning and engaged. So. Um, I wanted to add something I totally forgot about when I answered DeAndra's uh, question. There are amazing trainings that come from the World Economic Forum that we have access to. So for example, right now we're getting, uh, people are applying uh, to a climate resilience training. Um, I think it's a couple of days and like, you're talking about people, the best people in the world coming and talking just to global shapers. Um, people can also apply to go to the Davos conference. Um, so there's a lot of things that the World Economic Forum does to um, basically train and give the skills necessary for the youth to uh, work on these issues. Like one of the pillars is climate. They do a climate resilience training. Uh, if another training is on X, they try to do it. So there is trainings at the World Economic Forum level. They're not, you You as a global shaper always have to apply into them. Um, but then you also like, I'm in so many global shapers hub uh, chats on WhatsApp from people all over the world. And then they run trainings on their own. So it's very organic. Um, it really is as much as you make out of it. Um, and on that note, um, I just want to thank everyone for, for listening to us, Lexi, Luisana, for, for coming. And then, Yanni, I'll pass it over to Yanni or uh, Sherry. Um, thank you so much for having us. No, thank you. This has been so, I, just, I love it when I bring people that are close to me and I collaborate with, and I still end up learning so much about how amazing you all are and the work you do. So I appreciate you all for being here. Um, and I'm just going to also thank all of the students and thanks Sherry for letting me guest host today. I love when I do that. And Sherry, I'll let you uh, say the final words. Um, join us again next week um, where you will hear more amazing things like these ladies have shared. It's uh, This is such an exciting opportunity. I wish I was young enough to join you guys. I like don't I'm too old. That. So, <laughs> so take that advantage. <laughs> do it now. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Have a, a safe um, Tuesday, and we'll see you next Tuesday. And thank you to our speakers for yeah yes. for sharing such, so much, such amazing resources. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye.